Okay, hi everybody. Um, we always plan to start at maybe 5.32, just to give everybody a little bit of a window here. Um, but we're excited today to do a tour of Missouri's natural communities with our special guest, Mike Leahy. I'm just gonna do a little quick uh, house cleaning here and we'll get started. So we at the Missouri River Bird Observatory, um, we're really excited about this one. It's another great talk, a guest that's going to uh, mesh nicely with our core values. Um, so it's in our stated mission. Um, they are expressed in these eggs up here. And uh, we've worked with Mike in, in both quality habitats and people in nature. And we've also worked with them to promote uh, conservation of birds uh, in our mission statement through scientific research and bird population monitoring and uh, education and outreach. So uh, we at the Missouri River Bird Observatory are, are, are pleased to present this. If you wanna find out more information about our organization, uh, just visit mrbo.org. Uh, the other housekeeping slide I have here is about the webinar format. If you're not familiar with it, um, we have a chat function and that's really good because we'll be providing, we can provide resources in that. Um, and also we have a Q&A feature and that's the best place to put your questions in because we can end up with a little time at the end here and we can follow up with uh, some Q&As. So uh, like I said, we're really fortunate to have Mike around. Uh, Mike is a consummate professional uh, with not only, not only great expertise across the ecological spectrum, and from prehistory to present, but he's got a good sense of humor too. Um, perhaps his depth of knowledge runs deepest in our rarest natural communities, and the value of his unique skill sets really can't be understated. Uh, Mike has worked for over 25 years with the state natural resource agencies in Indiana, Virginia, and Missouri. Um, for the past 13 years, He's been uh, the natural areas coordinator for the Missouri Department of Conservation, as well as their acting natural heritage program ecologist, which is a pretty important role. Uh, Mike has written many technical and popular articles on aspects of natural history um, in the states he's worked in. And he got a bachelor's degree um, in forestry from the University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point and a master of science degree in forest ecology at Michigan State University. He lives in Jefferson City with his wife and son and enjoys exploring the outdoors with his family and friends. So uh, now without too much further ado, uh, Mike Leahy. Stop my screen share. Unmute myself. <laughs> Hooray. Thank you, Mike. All right, well, thanks for that wonderful introduction. We will go ahead and start our program here. So tonight we're gonna to take a tour, a virtual tour of Missouri's natural communities and learn about the uh, fascinating natural history and natural heritage that these places have. And ideally we would get in a van and travel around the state, um, say in the month of June and, and just see all these places together. But tonight, um, we're gonna do it virtually and, and take a tour of our natural communities. So sit back and enjoy a tour of our state's great natural heritage and feel free to ask questions as Ethan indicated through the chat and through the questions. And we'll have time at the end for questions as well. So here in Missouri, we have a great wealth of native biological diversity. For example, did you know we have over 2,000 native vascular plant species, which is greater than the flora of Alaska? Of course, we have many different native breeding bird species, at least 150 different species, such as this gorgeous scarlet. Mike, Mike, yes. I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing your presentation. Oh. Unless you just want to sit there and talk at us without any visuals. No, no. I wasn't, honestly, I wasn't sure. I was like, okay, he's just giving an introduction and I, yeah, but. Okay, so let me try that again. We saw your beautiful slides yesterday, so I don't want to miss those. Yay, now we're seeing something. Okay, good. <laughs> Thanks there for letting you know. me know about that. Okay, well, we'll yeah. Perfect. step back. So yes, we're gonna be taking a tour of our natural communities here in Missouri, learning 
what that term means and learning more about the wonderful native biodiversity we have here in the state. So as I was saying, we have over 2,000 native vascular plant species in the state, over 150 native breeding bird species. We've documented at least 400 native bee species, 120 native butterfly and skipper species, at least 60 native reptile species, which is more reptile species than the state of Montana, and an astounding um, 180 native fish species, which makes us um, ninth in the nation in terms of native fish diversity. Of course, many different taxonomic groups, especially invertebrates as well as fungi, we really have very little information about. And so as conservationists, we're tasked to conserve both hope, you know, high profile species, which can be endangered species such as the Ozark hellbender or important game species such as white-tailed deer. But for all these other species, we know very little about their life history. And so it's really tough to manage these other species on a species by species basis. So we take a different approach. We take a, a more of a coarse filter approach. And we try to manage all this biological diversity given our ignorance about so many species by using the natural community approach. And that is to manage natural communities which are distinct groups of plants and animals and microorganisms that occur across the landscape and through time as defined by Paul Nelson in his landmark Terrestrial Natural Communities of Missouri book. And natural communities are essentially a fancy term for habitats for plants and animals that are least impacted by modern humans and occur where the soils, the geology, and the climate, and the hydrology are similar. So we'll delve into the details of all these different community types. The first thing that we wanna look at are regional climate patterns. So depending where you are in the state, the climate can be very different. Um, if you're north of St. Joe, Missouri, you have about 34 inches of precipitation a year versus say if you lived near Kennett, Missouri, down in the boot heel, you're getting over 50 inches of rain a year and you can grow cotton and rice. So there's a lot of difference even within our state in the regional climates. The geology of the state is very important, especially in the Ozarks in terms of what types of, of rock are forming your soils. Are they rocks that weather to acidic soils or are they rocks that weather to more um, neutral to alkaline pHs? And so soils really drive a lot of what we see on the landscape in terms of what plants and animals occur where. And that includes the soil moisture, the texture of the soil, whether it's sandy or silty, the depth of the soil rooting zone, and the soil pH. And then the lay of the land. What are the land forms such as ridges or valleys, whether you're on a north slope or a south slope, whether it's a steep slope or a gentle slope, all these physical factors really influence where plants and animals occur and where our different natural communities occur. And the similar principles apply for our aquatic communities. They have different physical factors that are unique to aquatic communities. And these include things such as stream size and gradient, characteristics of the watershed, which is similar to factors that influence terrestrial communities, the flow rates of a stream, the chemistry of a stream, the temperature regime, whether it's spring fed or a warm water stream, the substrate, whether it's sand or gravel or silt. And those all influence the aquatic communities. Now, given my background as a terrestrial ecologist, we're gonna focus mainly on terrestrial communities. An aquatic community tour would be a whole separate um, Zoom presentation, it would have to be done by, by somebody else. But I do wanna to touch on them since they're so important for our native biological diversity and our, uh, basically our, the health of our, our state. So when we're looking at terrestrial communities, we look at the structure of the vegetation. Is the dominant vegetation trees and shrubs, just shrubs, or dominated by herbaceous plants? Now, when we think about natural communities, one of the key features of a natural community are what we call habitat specialist species versus generalists. So here in Jeff City, um, in my backyard, 
And in parks, I can find common ragweed and white-tailed deer and Canada, Canada goose. And I can also find those species in some pretty remote areas of our state. But I don't find things like yellow lady slipper orchid occurring spontaneously here. These species down here are what we call, whoops, we'll go back to that one. These species here are what we call our habitat specialist species or remnant dependent species. Another term, especially for plants, are conservative plant species. So these things have complex life cycles and they really define our natural community. So for example, lady slipper orchids depend on certain mycorrhizal fungi for their life cycle. The real fritillary butterfly shown here, um, which is a species of conservation concern, as a caterpillar, it feeds primarily on just three species of violets that are native in our prairies. This includes the arrow leaf, the bird's foot, and the prairie violets. And these right now are only found in critical mass on our remnant prairies. The northern crawfish frog, which is um, one of our largest frog species, is rarely seen. Um, it lives in prairies in abandoned crayfish burrows that the, gra the grassland crayfish uh, constructs. And the rattlesnake borer moth as a larva feeds exclusively on the rattlesnake master prairie plant. So these species have intricate life cycles and they characterize our natural communities for more degraded habitats, such as an old field. Another signature characteristic of natural communities are intact or unplowed soil. So a study that was done a few years ago by the University of Missouri and the US Department of Agriculture looked at the microbial biomass, which is an indicator of the health and diversity of a soil. And they compared that between Tucker Prairie, which is a remnant natural area, a prairie that had, was a planting that would, had been planted about 20 years ago. And these are all in the same soil type. And then a, a crop field that had, again, the same soil type, um, but had been a rotation of corn and soybeans for at least over 20 years. And what they found was that Tucker Prairie had uh, four times the amount of microbial biomass as the crop field and twice that of the 20 year old prairie planting. And so intact soils really help define our natural communities and we can rarely reconstruct these at least within our lifetime. It takes sometimes a century to rebuild soil. Um, and then if you were missing the right mycorrhizae, it could even take longer um, or not at all, depending on the community type. Now our natural communities are not static things. They're not um, things that don't change. There's always change going on in nature and the ecological processes of fire and flooding, soil saturation, drought, wind storms and storm damage and herbivory, whether it's from insects all the way up to large mammals, these all influence our communities and structure them and are part of what a community is. <clears throat> Geography is also very important in defining our natural communities. So looking at the broad patterns of geology, topography, hydrology, and regional climate, we have four ecological regions in Missouri. This includes the glaciated plains of North Missouri, the Osage Plains of West Central Missouri, the Ozark Highlands, of course, and the Mississippi Lowlands or the Boot Hill. Now we can model at least 15 different major natural community types in Missouri, which includes both aquatic, terrestrial, and cave communities. And then we can really, we can drill down and actually subdivide those into 15, or 30, I should say 85 different separate terrestrial communities and 35 aquatic communities. And we're not gonna cover all that tonight, but we're going to at least look at these major types and some examples from each. So our major community types for our terrestrial communities include forest, woodland, savanna, prairie, glade, wetlands, cliff and talus, and cave communities. And we'll further describe each of these during the talk. We also have seven major aquatic community types that we won't go into detail, but it's worth noting them here just because of the importance of our aquatic systems. And of course, our aquatic and terrestrial systems are completely and tightly linked. So we have headwater creeks, creeks, small rivers, 
large rivers, such as the Merrimack, and of course our great rivers like the Missouri and Mississippi, oxbows and sloughs like at Little Bean Marsh here, and springs such as Blue Spring. Now many years ago, back in 1977, the Conservation Department, as well as Missouri Department of Natural Resources State Parks, decided that they wanted to protect and conserve some of these last great places in the state. And so they established a Missouri Natural Areas program. The logo of the program was the Jack in the Pulpit, which shown here um, was drawn by uh, uh, Charlie Schwartz. And since 1977, other partners, including the Forest Service, the Park Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Nature Conservancy, have led the effort in acquiring and restoring natural areas to protect our best natural community sites. And these areas have high biodiversity. So for example, there are populations of 433 different Missouri species of conservation concern on designated Missouri natural areas, or 38% of all known occurrences of our rare and declining species, including populations of 19 federally listed and 34 state endangered species. So our natural areas are places where we really highlight our different natural communities and we both manage and learn from them on these spots. Today, we have over 190 natural areas comprising 96,000 acres of the state and over 90% of these sites are open to public visitation. So now we'll take a closer look at our different natural communities and their characteristic features. We'll start with prairie, which are fire adapted native grasslands dominated by warm season grasses, sedges, and perennial forbs with less than 10% tree cover. Now the word prairie is a French term for meadow and was a, a word used by the early French explorers in the middle of the US during the cent, uh, 17th century. Now prairies of course are characterized by grasses such as big blue stem, but they're much more than just grass. They include a wide variety of things, including sedges, rushes, and a whole season long of blooms of wildflowers, starting with spring wildflowers such as shooting star, to lead plant, to later blooming plants like compass plant, and the now blooming sky blue aster. And they're extremely diverse in terms of their native vascular plant species. So for example, a 40 acre remnant prairie of good quality can support over 200 native plant species. And you can get within a quarter meter or a quarter square, probably about the size of the seat that you're sitting on, you can get over 40 native plant species in that amount of area on a native prairie. And that native plant diversity and abundance, particularly all these blooming species, um, really translates into the importance of prairies um, for pollinators. And these range from generalist pollinators to very specialized pollinators like the blue sage bee shown here. Now tallgrass prairie as a, a community type really began to form about 15,000 years ago um, when the ice sheet and the last glaciation began to retreat. And then about eight to 6,000 years ago, the climate in the Midwest became more arid and warm than it is today. And that in concert with uh, cultural burning by the Native American populations and lightning fires led to this great expansion of tallgrass prairie as far eastward as uh, Ohio. And so fire really in the Midwest where we have a humid climate is the lifeblood of our prairie. And in the absence of fire, our prairies in this particular climate today rapidly succeed to shrubs and trees. Native Americans utilize fire for millennia for a wide variety of cultural reasons to help sustain our tall grass prairies. And then since then, um, here in Missouri, folks have used haying, and grazing, and fire to maintain prairies from the settlement period to, the, to today. Of course, conservationists today rely primarily on fire as our main go-to tool um, to maintain and conserve prairies. Interesting thing about prairies, which is different than our forests, is that most of the biomass in a prairie is underground in the root system, over two-thirds, which is the opposite of forest, which in forests, about two-thirds is above ground. What this does is it really enriches the soils that develop under a prairie. And they, you get these really carbon rich, um, you know, deep, dark soils 
known technically as molasols. Of course, the productivity of the prairie soils unfortunately also led to their general demise, as we'll find out. So this map shows the extent and tan of prairie about the time of statehood in Missouri. And we know this rough snapshot of uh, prairie in 1821 um, from two sources. One, uh, this map was put together by Walter Schrader, a geography professor um, who's now retired at MU. And he looked at the General Land Office survey notes. So in the 1800s, as the state was open to European American settlement, the federal government set out surveyors to basically walk a one mile grid, one by one mile grid across the state. And one of their charges when they were doing this is to set up a land survey system so that land could be bought and sold for further development. But as they went along this one by one mile grid, they also noted the vegetation and they specifically mentioned when they would enter or leave prairie as well as other vegetation types. And so this map comes from that and it pretty well correlates too with soil maps that show prairie soils. Of course today um, we only have uh, less than one percent, um, so I think one tenth of one percent of our original remnant prairie that hasn't been converted to previously converted to row crops, fescue pasture, or development. Most of the remnant prairie that we still have today in the state of the 50,000 or so acres that we know exists, about half of this occurs in what we call sandstone shale and chert prairies. These are rocky soil prairies that have quite a bit of either sandstone shale or chert fragments in the soil profile. And this rockiness um, really spared them the plow because they were managed as hay meadows by the early settlers rather than plowed under. Um, and that tradition continued up until, well, continues today um, in Missouri, which has saved a number of prairies in the Springfield Plateau and Osage Plains from development. And Missouri is fortunate compared to our neighboring states, Illinois to the east and Iowa to the north, and having still some decent sized remnant prairies. Nothing like the scale or size of the Flint Hill prairies, but we have some uh, fairly large prairie remnants left because of these rocky soils. Some of the characteristic reptile species of these uh, chert and sandstone shale prairies include bull snake, the plains, or what was known as the ornate box turtle, and the southern prairie skink. Now in North Missouri, the soils there <clears throat> were developed from a glaciation event that occurred actually a long time ago, 500,000 years ago is when the glaciers actually covered North Missouri. Since then, LUS, which is windblown silt soil, covered the glacial till, and in that developed a rich tall grass prairie that is known as LUS glacial till prairie, very productive for agriculture, and so hence much of the remnants that are left are very small, but where they do occur, they often harbor rare or endangered species, such as the Western Prairie Fringed Orchid, and are just a, a unique habitat that we have very little of today. We also have bottomland prairies that develop in floodplains. These areas um, flood and or have ponded or saturated soils in the winter and springtime. They are mainly dominated by cord grass, and interestingly enough, there's a small, cute little cord grass plant hopper um, that feeds exclusively on prairie cord grass. And again, that's one thing that we continue to find out when people study the insects in some of these natural communities is the interesting relationship between the insect community and the plant community and these, these remnants. Of course, given that prairies have declined so dramatically over the past 200 years and our grasslands continue to uh, decline in, in wildlife friendly habitat, it's not surprising that grassland birds of all the groups of birds um, tracked by the breeding bird survey um, have shown the steepest declines. And of course, grassland birds occupy a variety of niches uh, within the tall grass community and they include both short and long distance migrants. Here we see Henslow Sparrow, Upland Sandpiper, the Dick Sissel, Eastern Meadowlark, and Grasshopper Sparrow. 
Now, it's important to note that while these grassland birds thrive on our remnant prairies, they are not restricted to them or tied to them as many of the plant, insect, and reptile and amphibian species that we've covered as well. They can use other habitats more readily, um, including prairie plantings and uh, wildlife friendly uh, grass plantings um, that won't harbor some of these other species. So grassland bird conservation is a little bit different than just pure prairie conservation, but the two are very linked. Now moving on to the opposite end of the spectrum with full tree canopy cover, we have forests with multiple layers of shade uh, adapted sub canopy trees, shrubs, vines, ferns, and herbaceous plants. And in our forests, trees typically get pretty large and tall, over 100 feet in some cases, and in the springtime, the ground is covered with uh, spring ephemeral wildflowers. And forests, as opposed to prairies, occur in areas that historically were protected, for the most part, from wildland fire. These are usually on north and east facing slopes, a lot of times at the base of slopes. And the dominant tree species include white northern red oak, hickories, maple, and occasionally ash and basswood, and elms. Forests are typified by shade tolerant shrubs such as pawpaw, ferns such as maidenhair fern, and like I said earlier, the spring ephemeral wildflowers that capitalize on the lack of uh, a canopy leaving out early in the spring. And so they complete their life cycle and set seed when there's ample sun on the ground of the forest floor. Interestingly, the seeds of bloodroot, Dutchman's breeches, trout lily, and some other spring ephemeral wildflowers have structures on them, on their seeds, called eleosomes, shown here with the ants in this picture. And these little structures called eleosomes are uh, rich in um, fat and protein. And what that does is it attracts the ants to gather up the seeds of these wildflowers. The ants bring them back to their nests where they eat off the little treats and then they throw the rest of the seed into the nest uh, garbage pile underground. And invariably, some of these little seeds germinate. And in this way, when you look at the distribution of, of these wildflowers across the forest floor, they're basically distributed by ants. So that's one of these another fascinating um, relationship between insects and native plants in our native communities. As well, some Lepidoptera species are very finicky eaters as caterpillars, and they, you know, they'll specialize on certain plant species or groups of species. So luna moths um, primarily feed on hickories, the spicebush swallowtail feeds on its namesake, hackberry emperor as well, and then the zebra swallowtail prefers a pawpaw. Now in our forests, having structural diversity in down dead wood and snags is very important for a variety of species. Uh, the down dead wood, um, besides building back soil, is also a uh, refugia for a variety of salamanders, including ring salamanders and spotted salamanders, um, that will utilize the soil underneath these trees during our hot, dry summer months. And then, of course, standing uh, dead trees are a very important habitat component for woodpeckers in terms of providing uh, insect um, diets as well as our snags and cavity trees are important for a variety of uh, birds, of course, that use them for, uh, for nesting or cavity nesters. So some of the forest birds um, that we have here in Missouri include the oven bird, the wood thrush, the Acadian flycatcher, and the red-eyed vireo. And they occupy different niches in terms of foraging and nesting within our forest environment. And uh, conservation of these birds, as well as some others, uh, can be quite complicated as these birds here, um, populations of them primarily uh, overwinter in uh, Mexico, Central America, and or South America. So conservation includes both on the breeding ground, the migrating ground, and then the wintering ground in countries where conservation can be a, a difficult task. Now, in addition to upland forests, we also have bottomland forests, which, like prairies, have suffered quite a bit of conversion to agriculture um, since settlement because they're level, and when drained, they can be very good for uh, row crop production. However, 
the ones that are left are, are really fascinating places and extremely important for biological diversity, um, especially places like Mingo National Wildlife Refuge, shown here, where we have bottomland oaks and hickories, as well as characteristic species, including the prothonotary warbler, the mole salamander, and the wood duck. Now, Missouri lies in a big transition zone between the Great Plains to our west and the eastern deciduous forest to our east. And so over geologic time, over the last several thousand years, the ebb and flow between wooded communities and grass communities has, has gone back and forth. And many of our wooded communities historically mingled with prairie and were influenced heavily by historical fire regimes, especially in the Ozarks on dry rocky ridges, uh, such as shown in this slide from Haha Tonka State Park. And here we had uh, woodland communities develop. Now, unlike forests, woodland communities um, are not home to many salamanders, but instead are home to many reptile species, particularly lizards like the broad-headed skink. We also know through dendrochronology that fire was an influence on our woodland communities as fire scars recorded in old growth oaks and pines, as well as ancient pine stumps, um, provide a record of, of the influence of fire um, for the last uh, couple hundred years um, in these communities, as well as historical evidence from writings of early explorers, such as um, Schoolcraft. So now woodlands are typically our dry site wooded communities in the state. We know that they're fire adapted. They have a tree canopy cover when restored of 30 to 90%. They have an open understory when restored. And in that, you know, with, with that restoration, the ground layer becomes dominated by a mix of grasses, sedges, and forbs, especially native legumes and composites. You can have over a dozen native legume species um, in a woodland easily. Oftentimes, but not always, the trees are stunted at maturity. Although pines, even on a dry site, can grow taller than the oaks. Typically, um, our species that we find in these areas include post oak, chinkapin oak, black and black jack oak, mockernut and black hickory, and of course, shortleaf pine. And woodlands are often associated with these rocky outcrop openings called glades that often occur on south and west facing aspects that we'll cover in a little bit more detail later. But in this picture, you can see the glade and then the woodland boundary. And these often finger into each other and can be quite um, complex in terms of the boundary between the communities. Now in Missouri, we also had a large area of shortleaf pine woodlands that were dominated by shortleaf pine mixed in with various oak species. This picture here shows a, an old growth shortleaf pine stand near Burst Tree, Missouri in 1909. And these shortleaf pine woodlands supported at that time, um, um, populations of the red cockaded woodpecker, which was last um, observed in Missouri in 1945, north of Eminence along Highway 19 area. Unfortunately, um, these pine woodlands were decimated by industrial scale unsustainable logging um, from the late, well, basically 1880 to 1920. And then afterwards, there were severe wildfires um, in the cutover slash that decimated the seed tree stock of pine. And so today, um, the conservation department, but in particular, the Mark Twain National Forest, as well as state parks <clears throat> and the uh, Pioneer Forest and the Nature Conservancy are trying to restore shortleaf pine oak woodlands. The best examples of this are in the Pine Knot Project in the Mark Twain National Forest south of Winona, where large scale restoration is occurring, shown here. And it's interesting to note the, the plant with the yellow arrow pointing towards it is Rattlesnake Master, Eryngium yuccifolium, which is a real typical and abundant prairie plant growing here in the woods. And it alludes to the fact that the plant species of Missouri. Um, has a heavy prairie component to it, even in many of our wooded communities. 
these open woodlands are important habitat for a variety of different bird species that the Central Hardwoods Joint Venture um, considers priority species for woodlands. And that includes the Eastern Wood Peewee, the Blue Gray Gnatcatcher, the Red Headed Woodpecker, the Yellow Belt Cuckoo, and the Eastern Whippoorwill. Now, as I mentioned, glades, which are these rocky open areas in the Ozarks and typically on south and west facing aspects or rocky ridge tops are usually intermingled as shown in this picture with woodland communities. You can also see in this picture, there's uh, skeletons of cedar trees. So in the absence of fire, our glades slowly encroach and become taken over by typically Eastern red cedar, which is fire sensitive species Eastern red cedar is a native species and its original habitat are glade cliff edges, essentially cliff edges where fire could not reach historically. But in today's landscape, they're very common and can readily overtake uh, a glade habitat or a prairie habitat in the absence of um, any kind of disturbance or management. So glades have shallow soils. They occur in a variety of different bedrock types and, and really add to the diversity of our, of our Ozark woods. So these include limestone glades, dolomite glades, and the difference between limestone and dolomite is that limestone is calcium carbonate, dolomite is calcium magnesium carbonate, and that magnesium um, makes dolomite a little bit um, more resistant to weathering than limestone. Igneous or volcanic rocks, which are very ancient, 1.5 billion years old here in Missouri, centered around Tom Sock mountain area, sandstone, and the very rare but um, unique chert glades in the Joplin area. Now glade plants have to be adapted to drought conditions and they have a variety of adaptations to deal with this. So for instance, Missouri black-eyed Susan here, the leaves are covered in hairs which slow down the evapotranspiration loss um, from the plant. Other plants like uh, fame flower here have fleshy leaves that store water in the winter and spring and then have those succulent leaves uh, are able to maintain that water um, through the drier period in the summer when they bloom. And then some plants uh, grow primarily in the winter, bloom in the early spring and then um, set seed and are done by uh, by springtime and avoid drought, such as the winter annuals like uh, glade cress here. Just like the plants, the animals that live on glades are, are pretty unique and adapted to these many desert conditions. So they include things like the tarantula, the lichen grasshopper, the striped bark scorpion, and the eastern collar lizard. And these species, a lot of them, um, the centers of their distribution is more southwest. So uh, Oklahoma and Texas is where their populations are, are located in terms of abundance. And it's thought that during that hypsothermal period that we mentioned during the prairie part of the talk, that these species migrated up into the Ozarks. And today with the climate as it, as it is, they found microhabitats in these glades where they could persist and, and thrive without competition from other um, animal species. And so you find these, these southwestern species in, in our glade habitats. And there's an extensive amount of glade habitat in Missouri. Paul Nelson and others have mapped uh, occurrences of glades. These are not restored glades. These are just glades on the landscape. Many of these are uh, covered in cedar and, and in need of restoration. But this map shows the extent of, of glade restoration opportunity in, in Missouri. And some of these glades, are particularly the ones down here in uh, southwest Missouri um, in the White River drainage basin. So to the east and north and west of, of Branson, um, they can be really large. So this glade is McClure Glade. It's on the Mark Twain National Forest south of Ava. Um, and it's over 100 acres in size. It's huge. And the Forest Service has done a really good job um, here along the Glade Top Trail at restoring these large landscape scale glade uh, communities. Now savannas are fire adapted transitional communities between woodlands and prairies. And in their restored condition, they have very low canopy cover, less than 
and they're essentially prairies with scattered trees. <clears throat> and we know historically that there were areas like this throughout the state, um, especially where more wooded communities met more open prairies and, and terrain that wasn't as dissected as forest areas, but not as flat and, and rolling as the prairie lands. Now today, of course, we have a lot of fescue savannas or park savannas. So we've got areas with scattered trees, but instead of the intricate community of native plants and insects down here on the ground, we have either Kentucky bluegrass or tall fescue. And so we don't get the same result as a native savanna, such as this one at um, Long Branch State Park. Now, savanna bird species that are considered priority for conservation in Missouri include the northern bobwhite, the red-headed woodpecker, again, we saw that in woodlands, the prairie warbler, the yellow-breasted chat, and the field sparrow. And of course, these birds are not completely dependent on savanna habitat. So for instance, the prairie warbler also will utilize early successional forests, um, succeeding old fields, but it is a signature species of a restored savanna condition. Now in reality, the lines between prairie, savanna, woodland, and forest are not as neat and tidy as um, we would like to, to think. And of course, you know, as humans, we like to pigeonhole things into, into boxes when in reality there's a very broad continuum and particularly when you're looking at the differences between uh, is a site a woodland versus a forest versus a savanna, there can be very fine lines between these two. I mean these four communities. So in nature it's in reality a continuum between the true forest and the prairie. And there's a lot of gradation between those two ends of the spectrum. Now moving on to some more wetter conditions. Um, we have covered already bottomland prairies and bottomland forests, which are um, ecologically speaking definitely wetlands, but we're going to look at uh, now some areas that are uh, unique wetland habitats and different wetland habitats. Of course wetlands are areas that are either influenced by flooding or soil saturation for long periods of the growing season and they're dominated by obligate wetland plants. And of course, wetlands have declined greatly um, in the state due to uh, conversion, particularly in the Boot Heel and the big broader floodplains of North Missouri, the Missouri River. Um, however, in recent years, the uh, Wetland Reserve Program has been a really successful program at, at restoring uh, thousands of acres of formerly cropped lands and um, cleared lands into wetlands that may not be what they were historically, but are ecologically um, very important and in restoring ecological functions to our landscape. So in this slide, we see an old growth cypress stand um, at Olive Road Lake Natural Area, which is uh, down near the Arkansas line and, um, you know, looks like Louisiana, except for there aren't any alligators in it. Um, but a really cool place. Now we have a variety of different marsh wetland types. Now marsh is a herbaceous wetland, <clears throat> but it's a very broad term and it, it can encompass lots of different marsh subtype communities. So marshes can range from um, the one at Van Meter State Park that is dominated by emergent perennial plants such as river bulrush, um, burr reed, to more uh, early successional marshes um, that can be found at places such as Grand Pass Conservation Area or Eagle Bluffs where um, active management creates um, annual dominated marshes dominated by things like uh, wild millet and the annual smart weeds. Um, and then there are things in between. And then of course, in a marsh system, the plants really uh, separate themselves out in terms of their tolerance to flooding and inundation. So you get a gradation from fully aquatic floating plants and submerged plants to those that are right at that borderline between aquatic and terrestrial. And certain plants, um, like in all communities, are, are host to different uh, insect species. And so swamp milkweed shown here, which is a 
a great plant um, to utilize in rain gardens for uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars, which really eat this plant up. But it's also uh, has a specialist insect that feeds on it known as a swamp milkweed leaf beetle, which again is another one of these neat couplings between a, a plant and an insect species in our remnant communities. So our marsh communities, like I said, again, they range from more immersion plants such as the uh, American Lotus, seen more in the background in this marsh at Shanks Conservation Area to you know, earlier successional marsh species uh, shown in the foreground here. And marshes are very important for a variety of life forms, including amphibians, like these sirens and salamanders at Duck Creek Conservation Area. Of course, shorebird migration. Um, <clears throat> all the shorebirds that come through the state utilize mud flats and early successional marsh habitat. Waterfowl as well. Um, being here in the mid-continent, our early successional marshes are important habitat for waterfowl as a, uh, as a feeding ground um, on their way to migrate, both in the spring and the fall. For wading birds, such as herons, and egrets, and also for um, some of these secretive marsh birds, bitterns and rails that both migrate and sometimes breed in the state. And our wetlands um, provide fish larval nurseries, as well as uh, provide for um, odonates such as dragonflies and damselflies. Now beyond marshes, we also have a lot of unique wetland natural communities that are less seen. Um, one of these are fens. Now fens are where groundwater, typically in the, in the Ozarks, percolates down through calcareous bedrock, limestone or dolomite, and then hits a confining layer and creates this groundwater seepage <clears throat> that supports uh, plants and animals that like a cool, moist environment that are considered glacial relics. This includes things like the four-toed salamander, which its center of its distribution is more north and east of Missouri, and it's thought that it was more abundant in state, probably um, when we had a cooler climate during the glacial period. And then since then, it has found its microhabitat where it can persist in these fens, as well as um, acid seep natural communities. So fens really add to the diversity of our Ozark landscape by providing these isolated wetlands in an otherwise very dry environment. Another example of this are sinkhole ponds, which is where <coughs> a cavern or cave underground has collapsed or weathered away, forming a sinkhole depression that then is plugged um, by a clay or um, organic layer, creating a natural pond which is our actually only kind of natural pond in Missouri. And that can, uh, these typically occur in the Ozarks um, and they can range from more open sinkhole ponds such as this one at Tingler Prairie Natural Area to closed swamps. And a lot of times these sinkhole ponds have uh, plant species that are more, uh, their center of distribution is the coastal plain. So things like we have sinkhole ponds in the Ozarks that have water tupelo in them and cypress knee sedge that are disjunct by you know, many, many miles from other locations of those plant species. But they have found uh, suitable habitat, but isolated there in the Ozarks. Now cliffs are a pretty easy community type to define and they range from dry exposed cliffs such as this one <clears throat> at Grand Bluffs Natural Area, which are very glade-like, to more moist and sheltered cliffs. Um, such as these sandstone bluffs shown here, which are uh, protected and moist and that harbor uh, many species of bryophytes, so liverworts and mosses, as well as many fern species, which is different than those dry exposed cliffs. And we have talus slopes um, in Missouri, not very common, but um, talus slopes that are formed from limestone and dolomite often are uh, very important for land snails, including the uh, rare cherry stone snail, which is minute, shown here next to the penny, 
And then Missouri is a great cave state. We have over 5,000 caves and we're in the top three in the nation for the number of caves we have. And caves, of course, are natural openings uh, in the surface where a person can actually get into and go beyond the reach of daylight. And they form in Missouri in limestone or dolomite bedrock, which slowly dissolves over thousands of years from the slow percolation of acidic, slightly acidic uh, rainwater and groundwater. And that forms our karst environment, which includes caves, but also includes losing streams, streams that go down underground, as well as springs where that water from the groundwater comes out, and sinkholes that we mentioned earlier. And our caves are, are really interesting um, kind of cauldrons of evolution because they're so isolated, they create um, many new species from this isolation. And they also create interesting adaptations to the cave environment. So most the true cave uh, creatures called troglobites, such as the grotto salamander, the cave crayfish, and the cave fish shown here, they've all lost their pigment and their uh, uh, ability to see through time because they aren't needed in a, in a cave environment. Now other cave creatures such as bats that utilize them for hibernation and maternity roosting um, don't have those adaptations. They're only there for part of their life cycle. And unfortunately, a lot of our bat species like the tricolor bat shown here um, are suffering from the white nose syndrome fungi, which is uh, really uh, reducing a lot of our bat populations. The diagram shown here just show, you know, kind of what a Swiss cheese network um, our karst landscape is in, in parts of the Ozarks and how complicated it is and how vulnerable, vulnerable um, some of our cave and spring systems are to uh, spills of either fertilizer or sewage or hazardous materials. <clears throat> now, of course, we've looked at some really uh, high quality natural communities and natural areas during this discussion, but we all know that today's landscape um, is filled with stressors and threats to our to our natural communities, um, ranging from invasive species to increased development, uh, <clears throat> industrial agriculture and the like. And so many of our natural communities and natural areas don't have the ecological processes that they uh, evolved and developed with. Um, things like fire and flooding. And <laughs> because of the fragmentation of the landscape, we, uh, we just can't often walk away from a site and, and hope that it'll take care of itself. Usually some form of active natural community restoration, whether it's uh, reinstating fire or flooding, controlling um, invasive species, <clears throat> these are all necessary steps to help conserve our native biodiversity in the modern environment. Excuse me. <clears throat> but the best way to learn about these places and natural communities is to actually go visit them. And so we have a uh, online directory of natural areas that shows all the natural areas that are open to the public, which are most of them. Um, and you can find information in visiting those natural areas as well as uh, Google map links. And the easiest way to get to this webpage, which is on the Conservation Department's website, is to just Google Missouri Natural Areas. The other source of information is a guidebook that we sell. It's $11. You can buy it at Natural Area uh, Nature Centers, as well as some MDC offices. Is a, a guidebook to 50 of our natural areas that, um, that we've selected to highlight. But the webpage actually has all 180 natural areas that are open to the public. Uh, but these are both great resources to use um, to get out and explore some of these natural areas. And of course, um, many great photographers contributed to this presentation. And with that, um, I will end the slideshow. And hand it over to Ethan to see if we have questions. Maybe um, let Jana, Dana jump in here as well. Thank you very much for that, Mike. We really enjoyed that. Um, Dana and I are just always like, oh, I wish we would have known this when we first started working in Missouri. Uh, all this great information. And you kind of stole thunder with one of my questions that I had right off the bat. Uh, 
um, which was, you know, where to find more information and where can we experience these awesome gems that you're talking about? Because you really can't find a lot of these things elsewhere. And since you stole my thunder on that, I'm going to up the ante and ask you a question about what if we have people on here from other states? Is there some sort of natural, national resource uh, for people to find information on natural communities in their own state or are they going to just Google? Oh, you're muted, I think. There's two sources of information, Ethan. One would be the, the Natural Areas Association has links to each state that has a natural areas program, um, which is probably the best way is to go to the Natural Areas Association webpage and then go to their state programs link, and then that will give you links to each, st each state that some states don't have a natural areas program, but those that do are in there, and you can find similar resources that way that's probably the best if you're going to a different right. and then um, each state also has a uh, natural heritage program to the natural heritage database and you can find um, contact information for each of those through um, the nature serve website and those people often know if there isn't a state natural areas program, the natural heritage biologists often know these places that are hard to find <laughs> otherwise. Hey, Mike, it looks like we have several questions and several nice comments. I was wondering if, because I mix these up kind of a lot, if you could just quickly define restoration versus reconstruction, because I know they're different. And yes, yeah, and that's one that, that is confusing. So restoration is when you have a, say a glade that hasn't been plowed or bulldozed or whatever, and you're removing cedar and you're adding fire back into the system. And you might actually, you know, if, if the glade, you could do some spreading of seed on that glade um, to restore some of the plants, but the soil is still intact. That's the main thing. So with the reconstruction, the soil has been either plowed or topsoil has been dozed off or, or you're severely eroded maybe from severe overgrazing. Um, but that, that topsoil is lost and, and, or, and or completely altered in a reconstruction. So you're putting back plants to an area that doesn't have that intact remnant soil. So like, Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's the biggest difference. So like if you're planting trees in an old crop field or prairie planting in a, in a soybean field, that's a reconstruction versus a restoration is, could it be a prairie that they overseeded fescue in, but they never plowed the soil. Okay, thank you. Those, all right. I've, I feel like I've often interchanged those incorrectly. Yeah, because once the soil gets plowed for a couple of cycles, it really, it's a real game changer in terms of putting Humpty Dumpty back together again. It takes a lot longer if it's been plowed. Okay, um, we have a couple comments quickly. Absolutely amazing, fascinating facts. One of your best webinars yet. Yay. Yay. Um, blue sage bee is a cute charmer. Great presentation. I totally have to agree with the blue sage bee comment. And it's all about soil. Um, our questions, what challenges does global warming present to reestablishing historic native ecosystems? Whew. Yes. Um, <laughs> I wish I had a crystal ball and I could answer that question quickly. But um, it really poses a question. Uh, we know it's getting warmer, it is getting warmer. What we don't know in Missouri is, is the precipitation going to be, we know the precip precipitation is getting more erratic with more severe, actually heavy rainfall events. And it, recently it's been getting wetter, but we don't know if that's gonna continue or if we're gonna have a hotter, drier or hotter, wetter environment. And that could make a big difference. I do know that probably the most vulnerable systems are our stream and wetland systems to, um, reconstruction and restoration in terms of global warming. And probably our 
our grassland and woodland systems are probably will probably be more more resilient but again there's so many factors in play it's the the pace and then the again the, the thing that really stresses the system is just the if the climate the more erratic the climate gets in terms of extreme rainfall events um punctuated by extreme droughts that that's just not it's not easy for things to adapt to that kind of a system. Is it possible that the uh, increase in carbon could uh, affect things like uh, woodies on our grasslands? Yes, there's evidence from, yeah, from um, Kansas State University at Kansas Prairie has been looking into um, the effect of increased CO2. And there's some, uh, there's evidence that that increased CO2 is making things like, um, wing sumac pretty competitive with their native prairie plants in terms of um, being able to survive droughts as well as the, the prairie grasses. Um, and there was a whole article that that I did with uh, Steve Bubeck and Dave Hoover in the last issue of the Missouri Prairie Journal um, that looked at woody encroachment in our prairies. And one of the factors among many was increased CO2. And then just the physiology of woody plants. Um, they're learning a lot more about that. Um, and they're learning a lot about the physiology of prairie plants. At one time we thought those deep roots in prairie plants allowed them to bring more moisture up, but that's not the case. And so they're not, they're struggling. We actually, right now, we don't really know why prairie plants have those really deep root systems because most of the prairie plants, the grasses are, um, drawing moisture from the first 12 inches of soil. And then the shrubs are actually, they're the ones have the steep taproot and they're actually getting the moisture from down low. Um, so th there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of unknowns on that woody encroachment issue. Mike, I just wanna in that vein, give a shout out to, you know, the Department of Conservation and Missouri State Parks and, um, the Forest Service, private landowners, all land managers, because all of you are trying to not only manage an entire ecosystem on these small postage stamps, but now with this uncertainty due to climate and the erratic climate, it's even harder than it would have been, which was already very difficult. So thank you. <laughs> um, well, there's a few more questions here. Uh, bats with white nose syndrome, do bats with white nose syndrome introduce any foreign bacteria or microbiomes to cave systems, maybe through feces, shedding, et cetera, that affect cave health? I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I do know that as the bass species, as bass decline in abundance in a cave ecosystem, that means there's less guano or bat poop, which is kind of the base of the cave ecosystem. Um, so if our bat populations really crash bad, that's going to have ripple effects for a lot of other critters that all these invertebrates feed on the bat guano. Um, and that kind of forms a base, a lot of their food chains. So um, I haven't heard about any evidence of other bacteria coming in or fungi other than the, the geomyces that causes the white nose syndrome itself. I have a quick one that I can answer here. Someone says, awesome presentation. It was a little bit overwhelming. Will this be put on YouTube or somewhere where I can look at it again? And the answer to that is yes. It will be posted via the merbo.org, merbo webinars page, and there will be recordings that are YouTube linked directly on there. And next Mike question is, what is your personal favorite type of natural area and why? That's a tough one. I don't know. I like them all. It is, they're all, they all have their own unique, uh, you know, things that you like about them. I, I guess my, my favorite would be probably woodlands and glades because you get a little bit of both the open environment and the wooded environment. And plus it's nice to have some shade nearby at some point. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> Nope, nope, <laughs> not commenting myself either. Um, is a natural community a subset of a biome? Yes. Yeah, so the biome would be the big scale, and these are 
a scale down from, you know, from like the tall grass prairie biome. Okay. Um, two questions here that are not totally related, but semi. Um, so we have a question from Ryan that says, has our management regimes of natural communities, has they, have they, sorry, have they had any negative effects, i.e. what has decades of spring fire done to plant and animal communities? And then sort of related, at least in my mind, um, someone asked, is there any concern that by working to maintain prairies, we are preventing nature from adapting in ways necessary for long-term, and I mean really long-term survival, um, and I believe that that was in relation to climate change. So sort of, it seems like a little bit more like short-term question and very long-term question that are semi-related. Yeah, we've learned a lot and continue to learn. And we certainly, there's stuff we're doing today probably that we'll shake our heads at 50 years from now um, in terms of our management regimes. I mean, we know that if we don't do the, if we don't do national community management that we lose biodiversity, but we've learned a lot that, you know, repeated fires in the spring or burning, if you've got a 40 acre prairie remnant and you burn the whole thing, <clears throat> you lose things like regal fritillary butterflies that have larvae that are fire sensitive. But then if you don't burn a prairie, you lose the regal fritillaries because the violets go away. <laughs> Those all, <laughs> it can be very complicated. But I, yeah, I would agree that um, we continue to learn from our past mistakes. And we, I, we, I think we're doing a better job than maybe 30 years ago, for sure, in terms of our knowledge. But having that basic knowledge of natural history and, and then doing experiments, we just got to continue to do that, um, to learn as we go. And then for prairies, you know, the thing about prairies is that <clears throat> they have done studies at the University of Minnesota where they looked at um, the carbon footprint of prairie management. And this may be different and probably is different for woodlands, um, but at least for prairies that are established as prairies or prairie plantings, the, uh, you, you know, you, when you burn a prairie, you have a, a pulse of carbon go up into the atmosphere, but the increased growth that sucks carbon back down into the root systems because of the burning versus not burning a, a prairie or field actually offsets by quite a bit of a factor, I forget what it is, um, the, that pulse of carbon that goes into the atmosphere. Um, and actually when the prairies, when there was, there is a signature of, of carbon dioxide when the prairies were plowed um, in the 1800s through like the late 1800s, there's this CO2 bubble in the ice core where all this carbon was released when they, when they plowed all these prairies. Cause you think about all the carbon that was released, <laughs> it was a lot. Wow. Um, we're, we're both sitting here going, wow, wow. We did not know that. Um, um, Mike. Three restorations. Oh, okay. You're seeing it. Cool. You're seeing it too. Um, gosh, I, it depends. <laughs> well, I, I think one of the, the neatest ones that's happening right now is the um, work the Mark Twain National Forest is doing to restore pine woodlands um, in the Ozarks. And then ongoing prairie restoration by a whole variety of um, organization. So, you know, the Conservation Department, the Prairie Foundation, private individuals. Um, I think that's all really important. And then wetland restorations too, with the, like the wetland reserve program has just really restored a lot of wetlands across, I mean, really changed over the last 20 years, how much wetland acres we have in the state. You don't have to burn a glade when doing a restoration. Um, you can remove the cedars, which will help in and of itself um, if, if burning is not an option, which would be better than not removing the cedars. Um, but burning does always help in a glade restoration, but it's not, if you can't, you know, if it, if it was a choice between leaving the cedars there or removing them and at least opening some sunlight up, I guess, removing the cedars would be better than doing nothing. Uh, but if you did that, you wouldn't want to let the cedars, the thing about if you just cut the cedars, let them fall right there and not put them into piles, you might end up smothering the glade with, with cedar needles and actually smother a bunch of plants that may not come back. Um, so you'd want to 
pile up the cedar if you're doing a, a glade restoration without fire. I've heard they have to be careful too when you say you do are able to burn is say you pile them up and you burn it can burn a really hot fire that may damage the soils as well. Oh, so, yeah, yeah it it can sterilize so and it can also if out of hand it can I mean we've learned the hard way we've killed beautiful growth oaks <laughs> by having too much fuel in a glade restoration. Um, Susan Farrington, who's a natural history biologist at the conservation department in down in the Ozarks has gotten some, she's really kind of perfected glade restoration, but it's pretty labor intensive. If you're gonna, if you have it, you know, where you, you do pile burning of those cedar piles, but you do it in the winter time when conditions are cool. And so you don't create that sterilization. Um, otherwise, if you do do the burn, your first burn after after felling the cedars should be a really low intensity, slow, cool fire. And then just kind of do that once or twice before <laughs> and let that fuel be consumed um, under mild conditions so you don't do that intense sterilization event. Mike, is that true um, primarily of, of cedar and, and situations where there's been cedar encroachment or is that can any fire be so intense that you do some soil damage and sterilization? I think cedar is the worst just because of the aromatic oils and the, the, the intensity that it burns. But I mean, I could see, I could see <clears throat> oaks and hickories doing the same thing if your humidity was really low and you really had a hot fire. But I don't think it would be quite as intense in terms of the sterilization of cedar. Thank you. That was just a personal follow-up question. Go ahead, Eve. I think we got through uh, most of those questions. You know, right. I mean, it looks like Mike's still in the office. Uh, I'm still in the office. Hours <laughs> here. <laughs> I do want to go home at some point. Uh, I know, and we don't want to get in trouble with your wife. <laughs> no. We very much value our partnership. And by the way, shout out to the Missouri Prairie Foundation and Quail and Pheasants Forever that just today received uh, the Missouri Department of Conservation Conservation Impact Awards. And those are nothing to scoff at. Those are, those are big compliments to those organizations. And I know that you work with, with both of them. And so thanks for all that you do there, too. Well, thanks for Missouri Bird Observatory and all the work that you guys do, too, and putting on these Zoom meetings. And webinars are great. We had a couple more comments. So oh, you, no. I don't know, just this is pretty cool and great presentation. <laughs> and thanks for staying late at your office. That so yep. some nice, nice feedback. So and this will be recorded. I put this I typed this into the QA, but um, this has been recorded as have most of our previous webinars and they will be up for later viewing. So Okay. Cool. Thanks Excellent. so much, Mike. Yeah. You guys take care. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you. Thank you.